We are in Genesis chapter 19. Scripture reading is from verses 1 to 22. Verses 1 through 22. It's the Word of God. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. And he said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, however, no, but we shall spend the night in the square. Yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, and all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, so that we may have relations with them. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like. Only do nothing to these men inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand aside. Furthermore, they said, This one came in as an alien, and already he's acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. They struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. Then the two men said to Lot, Whom else have you here, a son-in-law and your sons and your daughters? And whomever you have in the city, bring them out of the place, for we are about to destroy this place. Because their outcries become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters and said, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. When morning came, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. When they had brought them outside, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh, no, my lords. Now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, for the disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please, let me escape there. Is it not small? Then my life will be saved. He said to them, Behold, I grant this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry! Escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the town was called Zoar. Whew. Strap yourselves in. Let's pray. Well, if y'all would, I need for you to turn to 2 Peter. Let me show you the template of this sermon today. A sermon I've entitled, God's Pattern of Condemning and Rescuing. And I'm going to show you where this pattern is coming from. It's written of in Genesis, but really, Second Peter lines out exactly why it was it was uh, it took place. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter two, verse four through ten. Peter's dealing with false teachers in the church, and he's saying, "What's going to happen to them? And what's going to happen to those that stand firm with Christ to the very end? What happens?" And so he's going to give you uh, patterns of God's saving how God rescues people and then how God condemns people. And it's really applicable to today. So 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 10, I'll just read it and say a couple of words, and then we'll go straight to our Genesis passage. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Here's the text here. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, 
having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. All right, look up here now. We're in Genesis today, but I just showed you the template of what's happening here in Genesis chapter 19. What we're going to see, Genesis 19 is a pattern. It's going to show throughout Scripture, how does God deal with the unrighteous? And when I say unrighteous, ultimately I'm saying the unsaved, those that never come to Jesus Christ. How does He deal with them? That in their stubbornness, they will not submit. They will not bow to Christ. And we'll see this in the Sodomites. And this is a pattern that we can trust. God will condemn them. It's coming, right? So if you're not in Christ today, come. And also, secondly, we'll see is that God will rescue the righteous. You'll see the term righteous lot in his righteous deeds. And you go, he doesn't look very righteous in this chapter. Well, neither do you in most chapters of your life. But God in his grace, right? He gives us his righteousness through the Son. So he rescues the righteous. He's going to take care of you. And, so not, and not just throughout your life, but, but every day of your life. One day he's going to take you home to glory, right? So, and the third thing we're going to see in this uh, text really is what a man sows, he reaps. Uh, it was my opinion, uh, stupid me, that that only referred to unbelievers. But you need to know today, this refers equally to believers. What a man sows, he reaps. Galatians 6 7, God is not mocked. What Lot will do here, y'all, is he wants one foot in the world and one foot with God's people, right? Lot wants justification in eternal life. He's, he, he loves that. He he's enjoys that. And yet he also so desires the stuff of this life. He wants power. He wants prestige. He wants money. Nothing inherently wrong with those things, and yet you can't get all that in Christ too. Because ultimately we are not called uh, to be anything more than simply pilgrims. Aliens, strangers. I've often said it before, if I were to start a Christian school one day, that would be our uh, mascot. It wouldn't be the mighty eagles or the lions. We'd be the strangers. It'd be just kind of strange to kind of cheer on, go strangers, go, right? But that would be the mascot because that is a picture of what we are in this world. We're strangers. We're aliens. All right? So, let's go ahead and dive into the text. Before we do, though, I, I really want to show you one other thing, and that is the four sins of Sodom. People have often said, you know, the reason why Sodom was destroyed was because of the sin of homosexuality. And that is true, but that's not the full picture, even in Scripture. Uh, the four sins of Sodom, first off, is, is the sin of homosexuality. Um, sodomy was the old term that was used for it. Uh, the sin that bears the name. Jude 7 says, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So don't kid yourselves in this day and age. Homosexuality is a sin. It destroys lives. Um, it's a very serious sin. Uh, Jude 7 is the term that says unnatural. And yet at the same time, we should still love these people. Right? As, as Christ himself would reach out to prostitutes, would reach out to the, to the ungodly. But one of their sins was definitely homosexuality. You don't, don't back down away from that, especially when liberal scholars will say, no, that's not true. No, it is true. It is true. That's one of the sins. There's several others, but we're going to li list really just four of the primary ones. Ezekiel 16, 49, it says, This was the guilt of your sister Sodom. Now, Ezekiel, he's writing to the Jews, and he's saying, Your twin sister is Sodom. That's how wicked the Jews had become. He says, uh, She and her daughters had pride and excess of food and prosperous ease, but she did not help the poor and needy. So here you see kind of a, a, a double sin here. Number one is their pride. Sodomites were incredibly prideful people. They thought they were the best. Secondly, uh, we have this, the pride of uh, the sin of selfishness. Incredibly selfish people. They don't think of others. They just think of themselves. So we have homosexuality, pride, selfishness, and then finally the fourth sin, Isaiah 117. He'll say, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. 
Once again, Isaiah is speaking to the Jews, but he's saying you're acting like the Sodomites who don't do any of those things. So the fourth sin that we see here is really a lack of social justice. Uh, because they have so much pride, because they have so much selfishness, they don't reach out to anybody, right? Um, those are the sins of Sodom, just to give you kind of an overlay. And then the last thing, what we'll see, here we have two angels in Genesis 19 that are coming to the town of Sodom. Uh, if you study Genesis, and I know Dan has done a great job of teaching it, uh, three angels actually visit Abraham. And if you know the story, Abraham basically dickers with one of them, uh, who is actually what most people believe, this is God. And he says, will you, will you destroy the righteous with the unrighteous? And so he, 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 gets, he goes down from 50 people to 10 people. And I'm sure Abraham's thinking, okay, if I can get my, my nephew Lot, his wife, the kids, maybe Lot has had some sort of influence in that town. Maybe there's 10 righteous and God won't destroy the city. God in His kindness keeps going down, 50 all the way down to 10. And He says, okay, for 10 I won't. And so, okay, we're good. It seems like God goes back to heaven. And the two angels are sent down to Sodom to find out if there really are 10 righteous. Okay, God already knows these things, but the way it speaks to us, the ways that we understand. Let's take a look now. Genesis 19.1 just the first part of it. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. Whenever you see a city gate in Scripture, um, you need to take note of that. Uh, in ancient times, the city gate was the marketplace. It was a court of law. It was a place of amusement. It was a lounge. Actually, the city gate had really large roofs. So it was a place of shade, especially in the, the Middle East there. But most of all, the gate was a symbol of power. Incredible power. Uh, Jesus, what does He do when He promises to build His church? He says, the, maybe you fill in the blank, the gates of Hades will not overcome it. That's what He's saying, is the, the strongest, the hub of power will not overcome it. Okay? That's, that's where that Jesus is speaking of. Here, we see Lot is sitting at the gate. What is going on here? Well, Lot here is now a city leader. He's a leader in the city. And really it shows the downward spiral of sin in Lot's life. And let me just show you this. Um, Genesis 13.10, when Abraham and Lot are kind of splitting up the promised land, uh, Lot, it says, he looked and he looked with longing towards Sodom, a wicked place, but a place that was green nevertheless. And he takes that area. In Genesis 13.12, it says he pitched his tent towards Sodom. So he's even getting closer to this place. In Genesis 14, 12, it says he is living in Sodom, in the city itself. And then now Genesis 19, he's sitting in the gate of Sodom. You see, interesting thing about Lot's life, he wants to see how close to the edge of sin he can get. And some of you may already be thinking, but shouldn't we reach out to those places? Well, hold on. I'll actually answer that in a moment because what we're going to find out is Lot isn't reaching Sodom at all. He likes to just live there. All right. All right. The rest of that verse and then on to verse 3. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. And he said, Now behold, my lords, turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, however, no, we'll spend the night in the, uh, in, the, in the square. Yet he urged them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread. And they ate. Did you all note how respectful Lot is? He stands up. He bows with his face to the ground. He calls them my lords. And some of you may automatically be thinking, well, he knows there's a there are angels. Of course he does. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think that's intimated in the text at all. I think he's hospitable like his uncle Abraham, as we'll see. But I think that's probably why that verse we see in Hebrews is mentioned. Don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Question, is that still applicable today? Yes, of course it is. I mean, beware if somebody comes up to you and says, Hi, I'm an angel. Stay away from that guy. But the point of it is, is that there are times that we come across, even in our own lives, strangers, it seems, that we better show them hospitality. That means love them. How do we do here at Believer's Chapel when we have strangers walk in here? Or when we see strangers on the street? It's a question we all have to answer. 
It's a good thing, though, to take care of them. So he says, turn aside. And he says, wash your feet. It's not like when your mom said, wipe your feet. He's saying, wash your feet in the sense that, hey, this is a thing of luxury. Because back in that time, the feet would get dirty. And he said, we'll wash your feet. We'll take care of you. We'll feed you. And they say, no, we'll spend the night in the town square. Now, you could spend the night in the town square back then. You just, if you've got a cloak, you put it over you and you just kind of sleep there. It's not typically a dangerous place unless it is Sodom. And uh, in some places were a little shady back then. And so Lot says, no, no, he urged them. Why is he, why is he so strong about it? Because he knows the wickedness of Sodom. So he prepared a feast and baked unleavened bread. Did you notice that singular? Did you catch that? Where's Mrs. Lot? <laughs> right? Or whatever her name was. Uh, she's not helping him here. Now, maybe she was out running some errands, but we see when Abraham, when these three men visit them, and they're not once again just men, they're the angelic host along with the Lord. Uh, Abraham and Sarah working together, and they're preparing a feast. Lot's doing it solo. I think the text is saying something here, that this is the one guy that's righteous in the town, but we'll see. Verse 4 and 5, Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, and all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men you, who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may have relations with them. Now this city is so wicked that all the men show up. Old, young, and it's, and it's kind of a given. This whole town is there. They say, bring them out. We may have relations. And that's actually, I prefer the King James, the way it says it, that we may know them. It's the, it's the Hebrew word yada, and it has a positive and or a negative context. A positive is, is the Lord, as, if you're a believer today, the Lord knew you before time began. Right? There is some semblance of that. Yes, He chose you before the foundation of the world. Uh, it talks about in Romans, now that, you, now, that you are, uh, now that you know God, or rather are known by God. It, that's the Greek, but it translates basically the Hebrew, yada, that you're known. That's, that's, it's the idea that you, God knew you before the foundation of the world. Not that you were a believer before the foundation of the world, but He chose you in, in His Son. This is not the good view of yada here. This is the negative connotation. The negative definition is to have relations with, to have sexual relations with, and in particular, homosexual relations. Uh, verse 6 through 8. Now, Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Now, behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like. Only do nothing to these men, inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. I'm sure a lot of ladies would not want Lot as your dad at this point, okay, if we're honest about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I will tell you, before we get there, though, it is commendable that Lot goes out. My guess is there's probably 40, 50, 100, maybe even hundreds of men that are outside of his door. And he goes out and he shuts the door behind him. Uh, as a friend of mine said, that was Lot's one shining moment. And uh, all grace and all glory to God on that one, but he does it. Uh, Bruce Walkey writes about this, and he, he says, basically, what if Lot hadn't have gone out? What if Lot had opened the door and told the angels, all right, guys, as far as I can take you, and uh, ushers them out? What have happened? Well, his thoughts are the angels would have destroyed the whole town right then, destroyed the city. Why? Because faith without works is dead. And Lot can say he follows Abraham's God, but if he will not protect, if he won't take care of those that are, God has put in his charge, mm -mm. now I know he, he mentions his daughters here in a moment, but I will tell you this, I don't think Lot, I think Lot knew that these guys are not interested in his daughters at all. Nevertheless, shouldn't have said it, and we'll talk about that in a moment. He says, don't act so wickedly, just when you think that, is Lot okay with Sodom? 2 Peter says he's not. 2 Peter 2.8, it says, Lot was greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Who was tormenting his righteous soul? He was doing it. And I think that's important to note. So he still is bothered by it. But instead, stupidly, he offers his daughters. What in the world is he doing? Well... This phrase is not new with me, but I think it's true nevertheless. 
Y'all, sin makes you stupid, right? It, it, and we should note this. Sin doesn't just affect your moral faculties. It affects your mind. You ever hear, read of stories of guys that have been in prison or uh, have been executed? You think, why did they do something so crazy as that? Sin makes you stupid. And Lot is thinking, I've got to protect these men. They've been put underneath my roof. But how about my daughters? And um, sadly, the law of hospitality at that time was, was, it said protect your host, I'm rather protect your guests, but never protect them at the cost of your own family. And Lot, sadly, is is doing this. Verse 9, but they said, stand aside. Furthermore, they said, take this one, or rather, this one came in as an alien, and already he's acting as a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. You notice what they call him? They don't call him Lot, do they? This one. By the way, this is what we do uh, in the vernacular. When we want to separate ourselves out from a person that we don't want anything to do with, we won't use their name. Uh, we saw this back in the 1990s when, when a former president said, I did not have relations with that woman. We would say the same sort of thing. I don't want, it's just natural, to, what we do naturally. And uh, so what they're doing is they're stripping a lot of his own identification. This one came in, right? And it's, it's, it's a way to show disrespect to. They had forgotten, ultimately they had forgotten 15 years ago. What happened 15 years ago? If you see in the text, Abraham and 318 men saved not only the city of Lot, they saved not only the people, they saved all their possessions. They didn't lose any of their possessions. And that was Lot's uncle. They knew that, but they've forgotten that. And so they said, now we will treat you worse than them. What is this? It is homosexual gang rape. Uh, they're, these, these guys are the real deal. And so they pressed hard against Lot, and they came near to break the door. And if you think about this intense, incredible wickedness, you think, why do they do this? Why are they doing this? Well, the Bible is very clear on this. John 3, 19, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people did what? Love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. I've heard this said before, and perhaps you have in another context. You know, if we just love people, if we just love people, they will listen to us, and we will win them to Christ. Right? Just love people, and and they'll listen. We'll gain an audience, and we'll win them to Christ. I would say two things about that statement. Number one, we should love people. Right? This is the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is the great commandment. Um, I have a concern. I have a concern with any believer, including myself, as I look in the mirror. If I don't won't befriend somebody because I hate what they do, right? R- rather, if that be the sin of homosexuality, transgenderism, I mean, think of the sins that you just really don't like, perhaps. If I go, I want nothing to do with them, I would say you're not following the footsteps of your Savior, right? He went after those people in love because ultimately he wanted to share the gospel with them. Saying, we're, we're his brothers, we're his sisters in the same way. We should seek them out, right? We want to win them to the gospel because ultimately we know we'd be in the same place. Maybe a different sin, but nevertheless condemned all the way. So make no mistake about it, we should love people. But the second point I'll tell you is this. Even if we do love people, they may still hate us because of Jesus Christ, right? Jesus says this. He says in John 15, 18 and 19, he says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. In Romans 7, 8, it says, The mind that is set on the flesh is what? Hostile to God. So I guess the balance, y'all, is this. The gospel is offensive. Make no mistake about it, but you still got to proclaim it, all right? However, you don't have to be offensive, right? You don't be offensive because your message is already offensive. So make sure that you're doing a good job of loving people. No, you're not going to win them to Christ simply because you love them. And you may not win an audience, but certainly to love them is the right thing. Verse 10 and 11. But the men reached out with their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the man who were 
uh, the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. <laughs> so those guests whom Lot tried to save are now saving him. And what happens? It says they struck the men at the doorway with blindness. And they're still wearying themselves trying to find the doorway. So this blindness is very interesting. It seems like this blindness was not simply a matter of, of uh, perhaps a temporary blindness of the eyes, but also the mind. They're, they're very clouded. They can't find anything. Um, and to me it shows this, is that God's judgment on the wicked, note this, is not going to change their nature. All right? Just because God judged them, you would think they would go, Oh, I can't see anymore. Maybe I should go home now, right? Maybe it's time I stop trying to commit gang rape. I need, to get, I need to get away from this place. But they keep going after more and more sin. And I would note this is that, y'all, this doesn't just stop in this life. God's judgment on the wicked, sadly, it goes on into eternity. Uh, you know, I, I, I've heard this before. You know, people in hell one day will perhaps say something like, if only I had come to Christ, if only I had come to Christ. I just don't think they will say that at all. Why? Well, I've got scripture for this. What do we see in, what do we see in hell? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see it several times. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. What is weeping? What's well, weeping as a result of sadness. Incredible emotional sadness. Physical pain. Horror. But you also have this concept of gnashing of teeth. And when you take a look at scripture, where do you see gnashing of teeth? We see in the Psalms. But the one you're probably most familiar with is in Acts 7. They pick up stones as Stephen is preaching, and they are doing what? Gnashing their teeth at him. They hate that man that's giving them the gospel. They want to destroy him. Folks, people in hell, they don't change. Their nature doesn't change. They don't have this sort of repentance. Oh, if only I'd come to Christ. No, they hate Christ. They despise him. They don't want to be with him. They want to overthrow him, but they never can because they're in hell for eternity. Remenance, remember this. Don't forget, repentance is a gift of God. 2 Timothy 2. If perhaps God will grant them repentance. He doesn't owe anyone repentance. It's his gift. He can give it to whom he will. So these men are not backing down. The judgment of God upon their lives, nothing. They're going to keep going after Lot's friends here. Verse 12 and 13. Then the men said to Lot, What else have you here? Or whom else have you here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters and whomever you have in the city. Bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So they're saying, Go get them. Get them now. Because the outcry. What is this outcry? This is an outcry for justice, I think. Outcry for justice. It's so great, the Lord has sent us to destroy it. The sound of, of justice has become so loud, God says, destroy this place. There's not ten people in the city. Destroy it. And what we see here is angels are ministers. The word minister is the Latin word for servant. It's the same exact word for deacon, except for de diakonos is in the Greek. But here they are ministers. They're, here we see them um, many times in Scripture as ministers of God's grace, right? Uh, Hebrews 1.14, it describes angels as ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. Somehow, some way, angels played a part in our lives uh, of inheriting salvation in a particular time. Maybe an angel in particular sent somebody your way so they would give you the gospel and the Spirit opened up your life and you believed. And yet, many in the world would believe the same thing. Angels, those are, the, those are the good guys, right? They're the people that love us, they protect us, they take care of us. Hmm. You see, angels are not simply ministering spirits of God's grace. They're also ministering spirits of God's wrath. Psalm 78, verse 49, it calls them destroying angels. You see, the world doesn't think about this enough, but honestly, angels, stay with me, are here to destroy you one day if you reject their master, Jesus Christ. They're going to play an active role in that. And right here in Sodom, they're playing an active role in destroying the city because they love their master. And if you receive their master, they love you. If you hate their master, they hate you. 
And they're here to destroy you. And we see this here. Go get them, they said. Verse 14, Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, and said, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. Or what we'd say, they thought he was joking. He was kind of messing around with them. And you may question, why would they not take Lot seriously? Well, maybe because it would sound pretty outlandish if somebody came to you and said, God is about to destroy the city of Dallas. And maybe you're like, whatever. And yet, I think there's something else because it doesn't say that they didn't believe him. I love what Bob Deffenbaugh, he wrote about this, and I just want to quote him. I can't say it better than he did. He said, notice that we are not told that they refused to believe Lot so much as they did not even take him seriously. There seems to be only one possible explanation. Lot had never mentioned his faith before. His words were not a repetition of his lifelong warnings of sin and judgment. There's something totally new and novel. What a rebuke to the witness of Lot. It is one thing to warn men and have them reject our message. It is far worse for them not even to consider our words as spoken seriously. Think about that in today's context, if you will. If you think, as I have, that by not mentioning the gospel to our friends and neighbors, I just need to wait until I gain more credibility with them, right? If I can just kind of wait and eventually give them the gospel, you think you're gaining credibility? You are wrong. You're wrong, right? By the time you mention the gospel to some people, they're not even going to take you seriously. I mean, many of us perhaps have lived in neighborhoods for 10 years. Never mention the gospel to neighbors. Never mention the gospel to neighbors. You've talked about everything under the sun. They know your love for the cowboys or your disdain for the cowboys. They know about your favorite teams. They know about your wife. They know your kids. They know everything about you. But you've never mentioned the gospel. And you think you're gaining credibility. Let me tell you what the scriptures say. Out of the overflow of a man's heart, he speaks, right? What's going on in the heart? I'm not calling you an unbeliever. I'm saying we need to be intentional what we do with the gospel, right? Uh, what is the gospel? You, you were a beggar and you found bread. God gave you bread. Why wouldn't you share the bread with others? Why wouldn't you tell them where the bread is? We're all beggars. We're all dying. Lot's not going to do that, y'all. He has had no impact, zero impact upon his city. Verse 15 and 16a. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. Why does he hesitate? What's going on? Well, probably one of two things. He may have think judgment's not going to really come. Look at the skies. They're fine. Who are these guys, by the way? <laughs> you know, a lot of you going, okay. Or, or I think it's really the latter. I think ultimately he's new, too attached to the world. He loves Sodom. He loves it. And as I said before earlier, I don't think he's interested in converting Sodom. And I know in the Old Testament they were supposed to really not so much go to the nations, but be a light to the nations. He's not a light to these people as much. I don't think. I don't see that. Um... I do see that he's too attached to Sodom. He doesn't want to leave Sodom. Verse 16b and 17. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. They brought him out and put him outside the city. When they brought them outside, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. I really hope one day, the Lord lets us see a picture of this. Can you imagine these angels that have been working, you know, from their side of things, been working with Lot. Lot, you need to go get your family. Go get anybody. We're going to destroy the city. And then finally, Lot is hesitating. He's perhaps, you know, looking around. He's maybe grabbing a few items that he needs. He's not doing anything that he's been told to do. And finally, one angel perhaps looks at the other and said, you want to do this thing? Yeah, let's go. So 
One of them grabs Lot, one of them grabs his wife, the other one grabs the two daughters, and they just start running. And whenever we see angels in Scripture, we typically see really large men. I get the idea they didn't want to run, but when two, two angels are grabbing you by either hand, you're going to run. And that's what we have here. And he says, uh, he, they seize their hands. And I think, I want to take note of this for a moment. 2 Peter 2.9 describes Lot as the pattern. He's the example of the righteous, right? He describes them as righteous Lot. And God, notice this, for the Lord had compassion upon him. Why is Lot saved? Lord's compassion. Why are you saved? Lord's compassion. Right? I mean, don't we see this in Titus 3, 5? It says, He saved us, not because works we have done in righteousness, but because of His mercy. Let me give you a great definition of mercy. It's not new with me. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. It's just not getting what you deserve. You deserve hell. And God not only doesn't give you hell, He gives you eternal life with a son. So that's the pattern. Of our lives, too. Ultimately, at a particular time and place, God in His kindness uh, sent us the Spirit. And the Spirit was already sent, but He comes directly to you. Um, you hear the gospel. He opens up to your heart. You believe. He grabs you by the hand. Let's go. He takes you. Not because of any righteousness in us. And so I want you to take note of this. We are still responsible to believe. Don't ever, don't go into hyper-Calvinism. That is, that is a dangerous. It keeps, you from, it keeps you from preaching the gospel to others. It's great wickedness. There, man, man and woman are responsible to believe. They are fully responsible to believe. People go to hell because they don't believe. Right? But it does come down to grace, and God gives us grace. And we believe. So when they brought them outside, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you automatically somebody comes to mind, right? Lot's wife uh, turns into a pillar of salt. You continue on in that chapter and you'll see that. I, I used to think as a kid, I thought, all she did was look behind. I mean, was it like she, she heard something? She turned around and, ah, oh, she turns to a pillar of salt? No. It, this Hebrew word is interesting. It's this idea that you look back and you intensely look. and You gaze. It's not a quick look. It's, and so we get this picture later on as she looks back, and she looks back with longing. She sees, she wants her house, she wants her neighbor, she wants her riches. And God turns her into a pillar of salt. So this is clear. It's not a quick glance. Do not look back. Do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills or you will be swept away. It's clear. Verse 18 and 19, we see Lot's incredible thankfulness. <laughs> But Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords. Now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, for the desire will, rather disaster will overtake me, and I will die. You see his incredible thankfulness? It looks just like ours, if we're honest. God saves us time and time again, not salvifically, but he saves us from tough situations. And we, you know, we've prayed so fervently for it. And then he, he brings us out of this miry pit again and again. And we go, thanks. And we go on, right? And that's what Lot is doing. But he's basically saying, oh, by the way, I can't go there, right? He, he doesn't think he can outrun the disaster. Or is there another reason? I'm of the opinion that there's another reason here. I think he's, he's telling him, I can't outrun this disaster. Folks, if you've got angels holding you by the hand, I think you'll be fine here. Um, but not Lot. Verse 20 through 22. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Behold, uh, please let me escape there. Is it not small that my life may be saved? He said to them, Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the town was called Zoar. Zoar means little one, or it just means little. And it's said twice. So here's what Lot is ultimately saying. Y'all have been so good to rescue me. I just need a little bit more grace so I can keep on sinning. I need Zoar. I just need this little one. I think there's a spiritual application here too for us. It's this concept, I want to follow Christ. I will follow him. I just want to hold this one sin and keep it close to my chest. It's mine. I'm not going to give this one up. 
I don't, I don't know what sins those are for you. I say in the plural because we sin every day. I know that. But you, I'm not talking about the sins you fall into. I'm, so, I'm talking about the sins that you cherish and you won't let go. And quite honestly, if we were to put your sins up on the uh, screen or wherever it may be, you, you, would, you would scramble, scream out, No! Don't show that! Congregation of this size, I have no doubt there's several men that, that engage in pornography. I'm intentionally not going to look at anybody here. But I'm telling you, in the world that we live in today, it's pervasive, it's across the world, and it's across the Christian churches. Let me tell you, if you're holding on to these sins, it'll destroy you. Change that. It is destroying you. Lot wants his little Zoar. He'll leave Sodom, but he wants Zoar. I like what James Montgomery Boyce writes about this. He says, there would be no danger if God always stepped in to per permit you from doing it, meaning from sinning, to keep your Zoar. But God does not stop you. There are limits to what God will permit. But nevertheless, God will let you sin. He will, he will let the Jews construct their golden calf. He will permit David to commit adultery with Bathsheba and then murder her husband. He will allow Gomer to run off with her other lovers. He will not interfere when the prodigal leaves home to squander his inheritance in a foreign country. You see, in the final analysis, God will allow you to do what you are committed to doing, and you will have to bear the consequences of your actions. Uh, Dr. Hannah at Dallas Seminary, he used to always tell the seminary students this, in particular men, because he spoke mostly to classes full of them. He said, men, beware of sin. Beware of sin. You see, the way it works is that if you keep engaging in that particular sin over and over and over again, if you're one of God's children, he, He's going to climb that hill, and He's going to break your legs, all right? And if He breaks your legs, you're going to limp for the rest of your life, just like Jacob, but you're going to bless His name for it, because He loved you enough to climb that hill and break your legs. It's going to be hurtful, it's going to be painful, and you'll weep about it for years. And then one of the students would say something like, well, Dr. Hannah, suppose, what if God doesn't climb the hill? What if He doesn't break your legs? Well, if God doesn't climb the hill, it doesn't break your legs. We see in Scripture that God disciplines those whom He loves. If He doesn't climb the hill, He doesn't break your legs. You live the rest of your life on the other side of the hill, and you die and go to hell because you were never one of His to begin with. Lot continues, he says, that my life may be saved. Lot thinks his choice of a small city is better than God's mountain, right? They tell him to go to the mountains, and he says, no, I want this city. And I would tell you today, ladies and gentlemen, the safest place for you to be today is in the will of God, exactly where God needs for you to be, right? The apostles, when they're in the boat, storm is raging. It's this concept of almost like tornado-like conditions, the safest place they can be is in the boat with their Savior, right? Yeah. Lot wants this city, and he's going he's gonna to go there. And so what, they, what do they do? They said, Behold, I grant you this request not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. You see, God is, is kinder, to the, and he's more merciful to the weak believer than we are. A lot of times, you know, you know what I'm talking about, the people you deal with at church, don't look at them right now, but, you know, you're just kind of needy, and you feel like I'm always reaching out to them. And, you know, many times we're ready to put that person in the morgue, and God is ready to put them back in the hospital. He wants to give them chance after chance after chance. He's more merciful than we are. And he tells Lot, okay, fine, okay, you can have it. It'll, by the way, it'll destroy his life here, as we'll see in a little bit. He doesn't... Uh, you can read it on your own. Lot's condition gets worse, not better. In conclusion, I'd like to make those three points clear once again. Number one, Lot, what a man sows, he reaps. It's true for us as well. And yes, those things will work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. But those hard reapings that we go through are going to be used to humble us. But folks, why sow if you don't want the reaping? Right? At least not in the negative way. 
Lot's going to reap it. If you continue on to read the chapter, you'll find out. Number two, once again, God will rescue believers. He's called righteous Lot in 2 Peter 2. He's righteous only because of what Jesus Christ did for him in his death, burial, and resurrection. Right? He's righteous. You see him in heaven one day. It's almost like Peter gives him a nickname, righteous Lot. And y'all listen, that's what you are today. Not because of your works. Because Christ saved you. So don't take that lightly. You are righteous in the, in, the, in the Father's sight. Not everything you do is righteous, but you have been justified. You have been seated with Christ in the heavenlies. So act like you are, right? Act like you are. This is what God sees you. You need to act like it. And finally, uh, thirdly, God will condemn unbelievers. 2 Peter 2.6, it says, By turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes... He condemned them to destruction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. You have family and friends, and as we get closer to the holiday season, you need to reach out to them. Yes, God will save whom He will save, but you are responsible to give them the gospel. Okay? Um, you need to know this. God's going to condemn unbelievers. He will. He doesn't have any... There's no plan B, right? Right? Plan A is come to know Jesus Christ. Trust in Him. Believe on Him. But there is no other plan. And I would note this as kind of a two addendums in this. You should note this. The people of Sodom were not as bad as the people of Jerusalem. Do you know that? At the end game in the Old Testament, the people of Jerusalem were more wicked than Sodom. He says this. Ezekiel 16, 48. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, your sister Sodom and her daughters were never never behaved as badly as you and your daughters have behaved. Wow. You want to hear some more shocking news? And that is this. The people of Sodom were not as bad as those here today who will not come to Jesus Christ. Where do you get that, Jeff? I'm glad you asked. Matthew 11, 23 and 24, Jesus says, You, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Capernaum was not a wicked city in the sense of sexual immorality. No. But they were incredibly wicked. Why? Because they had greater light. And ladies and gentlemen, you have also gotten greater light. Second Peter, I'll leave you with this. It would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness. Never. It would have been better for you all never to have heard the way of righteousness than to have known it and to turn your backs on the sacred command passed on to you. You know that? Some of you here and today, are, if you're honest with yourselves, maybe have never come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You need to know this. You're a sinner. The wages of sin is death. You're going to die and spend eternity in hell, separated from God forever. I say this not as, as, a, as, a, as a kind thing, as a terrible thing, in the sense that this is God's plan for you. But you know, God continues to tell us to give the gospel. The gospel is this. God in His kindness sent His Son, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, raised like any other man, but a perfect man, the God-man. And if you will turn from sin today and trust alone in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are assured of eternal life with Him. Right? That's the gospel. Christ is one day going to come back and make this whole world brand new. And all these gray hairs are going to turn dark again. All right? By God's grace. Come to Him today. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your mercy. Thank You for Your grace. Thank You for the story of Lot. And how you would save such a wicked man who you would also call righteous because of your son. Would you help us in here today that we would live for the king. Forgive us, Father, we pray. And we know that you will. That we have not been forward with the gospel. We have not been bold with the gospel. Help us to seek out the lost as your son sought us out. All glory to the son, we pray. Amen.